It never fails. No matter how I feel when I come in here after praise and worship, I always feel better. And uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Leon Barber. I'm the executive director here at Harvest Church. And today, Pastor is at St. Peter's. He's at his pastor's church. Yeah. Today, Bishop and Lady Joy are being honored for their decades of ministry. And I also believe it's their 60th wedding anniversary. So, uh, and I have to tell you on a personal note, my wife and I, and, um, and hopefully a lot of you, we have a great sense of peace knowing that our pastors have had the same pastors over their lives for 34 years and counting. <laughs> that's, that's an amazing. As a matter of fact, next Sunday, October 2nd, as Joseph said in the announcements, we're going to be celebrating our 24th church anniversary. And uh, yeah, amen, amen. 24 years, I, we, my wife and I have been here for almost all of them, and it seems like a blur. It seems like it just went zoop, so fast. But as a matter of fact, uh, we'll be honoring both our pastors at both services. And I have it on good authority that uh, Bishop and Lady Joy will also be in the house to celebrate with us. So it's going to be an awesome day. I encourage you to make it if you're watching online. If there's any way you can make it to the house, you will not be disappointed. So let's pray over the word that God is going to minister to us today. Father, as a person that's been assigned to speak to the people today, I ask you and I thank you for giving me the words to speak directly into the hearts of these, your precious folks. And Father, I ask you again to speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind as I impart your words and your words alone directly into the hearts and minds of the folks who are present here. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, last Sunday, Pastor started a series called Stay the Course. How many of you here either heard it or saw it, you were here? Oh, before I go on, uh, Kurt said a word up here. He used the word plethora. I wrote that down so I, when I go home, I'm going to look it up and see what it means. So I was like, oh, my God. It says, what have you been doing, man? You've been <laughs> plethora. Okay. All right. Anyway. Pastor started this series called State of Course, and during that message, he made a statement that hit me like a ton of bricks and has greatly influenced what I'm going to share with you this morning. You know, when Pastor asks me to minister a word, what I'll do is sometimes he'll give me, he'll say, I want you to talk about this particular subject, or I want you to pull out the uh, message that you gave on this particular topic. But in this one, he kind of left it up to me, and when we talked about it, you know, I was praying, and then when I heard him say that, and we were talking about it, I said, you know, you said something that really got me started, and it's really funny when I'm sitting in front of my computer, and I'm just believing God, and I just start typing. Fingers flying, smoke, fire, everything. I mean, it's amazing. But the title of this message is, Serving is More Important Than We Realize. Serving is more important than we realize. And my prayer is all of you will understand why before you leave here today. So let's start with this. The instructions that Jesus gave to the disciples and to the church after he was resurrected from the dead and before he ascended into heaven. Those instructions can be found in Matthew 28, 18 to 20 in the easy to read version. I love anything that has the word easy in it. Easy to read. I love it. Verse 18 says, so he, Jesus, came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. So go and make followers of all the people in the world. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I have told you to, to do. You can be sure that I will be with you always and I will continue with you until the end of time. These instructions that Jesus gave are commonly referred to as the Great Commission. And as Christians, we should have this at the top of our list of the mission statements for our lives. Another way to say this is to win souls and make disciples. Because as, as, as Kurt alluded to, who else is going to, but Jesus is going to help people? Who else but Jesus is going to free people? Who else but Jesus is going to heal people? Only Jesus. You know, I, I, I'm not going to say how old I am. I know Pastor Missy doesn't mind saying how old she is, but I've been on this planet a little bit now. And I can tell you, the government is not going to save you. I'm telling you that right. The, the folks on TV, trust me, 
they are not going to save you. They're in that business to make money, and they'll say and do anything to, to do that. Only Jesus can help us. Amen? Only Jesus. So we as Christians have an obligation to, as pastor says, keep one eye on eternity and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to be sensitive to folks around us who are closest to eternity and always be ready to share the gospel of Jesus or at a minimum be ready to invite them to church where they will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Folks, the only shot that every human being that's going through something on this planet has is to develop a relationship with Jesus. And through Jesus, they'll have a relationship with our Father God, and things will start turning around then. So y'all with me so far? I know it says, I thought he was talking about what Pastor talked about last week. I'm going to get to that. I'm going somewhere, but I want to give you the right perspective so that it makes sense as we go along. So Jesus gave us the Great Commission. Here's the second part. God uses the pastors of local churches to help win souls and just as important to make disciples of them by teaching them the word of God by word and example. Pastors who teach the word, pastors who live the word. And we are so blessed as Harvest Church, at Harvest Church, we have pastors that do both. I'm telling you, I have no problem at all following our pastors because what you hear from them and the way you see them act up here, that's exactly the way they are behind the scenes. Exactly. And we're going to do our part to obey Jesus' instructions. What is the mission of Harvest Church? The mission of Harvest Church is to love God, love people, and live with purpose. What's the culture at Harvest Church? Harvest Church exists to show God's love. Helping people is why we are here. The heartbeat of our church is driven by our identity in Christ, and we do life together by building community, unity, and strength. How are we going to do this? By following our vision. Well, what's our vision? Reach, connect, grow, and serve. We reach into our world. We stay sensitive to the opportunities to connect with people and to invite them to church. And here at Harvest, we help people grow by teaching them, training them, mentoring them, and coaching them. Four components to our vision, all are important, but today I want to focus on the serve component. As I mentioned earlier, pastor started this series last week called State of Course, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. you go online, go on YouTube, you can review last week's service, it is awesome. And um, during that message, he made a statement, as I mentioned earlier, it hit me really hard. To recap what pastor said, he was talking about hearing from God regarding specific directions in our life. Hey, we all want to know the exact steps and direction that God wants us to, wants us to take. Say amen. I mean, uh, pastor said if that's what we want, if we want to really hear from God, then we need to start serving in the church. And then he said where? He's like, anywhere where there's a need. Now listen to this. He then said, if we are serving in the church, oh, God knows exactly where we are when he's ready to give us the next step because we're where we're supposed to be serving. However, and this is the part that he said that really got me, if we're not serving in the church, it is likely that God will not give us more direction because we probably would not do it anyway since we're not doing anything right now. Oh, yeah. I, I said, first thing I said was, Lord, thank you. I am serving in the church. And I said to myself when he asked me to do this message, you know, I want to focus on this so that if you're not serving, here's, a, here's some good reasons why you might want to consider doing that. Let me repeat that. Our man of God, our pastor said that if we want or need direction from God as to what we need to do next in our lives, we need to start serving in the church. Where? Anywhere where there's a need. And then he said that if we are serving in the church, God knows exactly where we are. Man, I, I love it when my technology just, uh, just bear with me one second. First was the microphone, now it's the computer. The enemy definitely does not want this message to. 
Amen. Thank you. Where's Joseph? Oh, Roger. Roger, come here for a second, please. Oh, I think I might have got it. Yeah, no, come here. <laughs> this is stuck. It's not moving. Oh. See, you just took Roger. Thank you, Roger. Let's give Roger a hand. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lord. Now I have to figure out exactly where I was. Oh, okay. God said we need, I'm doing God. Pastor said we need to start serving in the church anywhere where there's a need. And then he said, if we are serving the church, God knows exactly where we are when he's ready to give us the next step we are to take. However, if we're not serving, it's likely that God will not give us more direction because we probably wouldn't do it anyway because we're not serving anywhere. I remember thinking to myself, oh, my God. So here's the perspective. Here's the perspective. We have Jesus' instructions to us to win souls and make disciples. We have Harvest Church's vision to help us obey those instructions by reaching, connecting, growing, and serving. And this fourth component of our vision, serving, is more important than we realize. So I'm going to talk about that today in order to teach you and encourage you to start serving. More than anything, more than anything, what our pastors want is for each and every person within the sound of my voice is to realize the length, the breadth, the height, and the depth of everything that God has called you to do in this life. Each of us has giftings. Each of us has purpose. You know, I, I used to not believe that until I came here. And, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But that's what our pastors want. But in order for that to happen, in order for us to get where God wants us to go, we must be able to hear from him. Amen? And in order for us to hear from him, we need to be serving. So that he knows exactly where we are when he's ready to give us that next step. Now, you don't need to raise your hand unless you want to. How many of y'all believe in God for something? How many of you believe in God for direction? You're facing the decision. You want a specific step to take. Amen. Amen. I, I see you. I see those hands. <laughs> Start serving. Praying is great. Getting advice from other people. But I'm telling you, there's nothing like Nothing like serving God, particularly in the local church. So let's talk about that, serving in the local church. For such a time as this, God is building strong local churches, and he is appointing and anointing pastors over those local churches. You know, that's why a pastor says when somebody comes to him and says, or when he was in Raymond, he was going to graduate, and, and he said he was around a bunch of folks, and they were, just, they were deciding what they were going to do instead of discovering what it is that God wanted them to do. And some of them said, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a pastor or I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to preach to the world. Well, the question is, what does God want you to do? Hey, Jay, good to see you, brother. I didn't recognize you, man, with your without a beard, okay? What does God want us to do? We need to hear from God because I don't know about you, but I've been out of the will of God. And now that I've by his mercy, grace, and kindness, and faithfulness, I find I'm in the middle of the will of God. I'm not planning on leaving. It's a whole lot better. D don't misunderstand me now. Life still happens. Jesus even told us. He said, things are going to happen. He said, but fear not, for I'm with you, and I will be with you always. But that advice is to Christians, people who are seeking God, and I believe people who are serving. So... God starts giving mandates to those local churches for those pastors to begin accomplishing through the local church what they have been appointed and anointed to lead. Every mandate takes people. That means you. That means me. To accomplish it. To actually do the work to bring those mandates to pass. Folks, that's us. We're the ones who serve. We're the, that's what we do. Whatever it takes to help pastors fulfill the vision for this house, to win souls and make disciples, that's what we do. So there's an additional bonus to serving here at Harvest Church. We don't just teach people how to serve. We teach them how to be servant leaders. 
I remember hearing pastors say many years ago that they really weren't interested in developing a bunch of leaders. What they want to raise up is a large number of servant leaders. What, what, I remember the first time I heard that word, I was like, what is a servant leader? What is that? Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 7 paints a clear picture of the greatest servant leader to ever walk the face of the earth. This is in the Amplified Version. It says this, let this same attitude and purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility, who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, in other words, Jesus possessed the fullness of the attributes that which makes God God, Jesus did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained, but he stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant or slave in that he became like men and was born a human being. And after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus came to serve us. Jesus came to serve all of humanity. He was the ultimate servant leader. And it's his example that we need to compare ourselves to. So what's the definition of a servant? A servant is defined as one who serves or ministers to or attends or helps another. Leadership is the ability of a person to influence others. One person can lead others to the extent that they can influence others. So guess what? The greatest leaders are not the ones with the biggest titles. They, they just aren't. The greatest leaders are the greatest servants. As a matter of fact, did you know that you don't even have to be in charge of anything to be a great leader? Let's, let's look, at, and in the Bible, um, one of the greatest examples of this is uh, King David, probably one of the greatest kings, you know, in the Old Testament time. So when we first heard about David, y'all remember the story David and Goliath, right? He slew that enemy of the Israelites. David came from herding sheep for his dad and came, and even though everybody laughed at him and thought he was an idiot, he slew Goliath. Now, after he killed that big boy, do you think he had some influence? Oh, yeah, he probably could have been elected for president of the United States after that. As a matter of fact, after David killed Goliath, if they had had cell phones back then and Twitter, his phone would have blown up, man. You know, here are the pictures on Instagram. Hey, man, here's me with David. I got it. I'm at, I mean, with Goliath, I got his head and everything. But guess what he did? David went back, the Bible says, to herding sheep for his dad. So here he was with God's help. He uh, accomplishes a tremendous feat for the nation of Israel. And uh, he now had influence with the people, but he went back to his original position of herding sheep. So what he was doing was he was leading from the back of the pack. And then if you pro progress, you'll see the next time we see David is King Saul summons him and asks him to come because he heard David is a tremendous uh, guitarist. And, he, and King, King Saul asked him, David, to come because King Saul had a lot of problems back then. And David's music soothed him. And as when David entered the king's court, now he had even greater influence. So he was in the middle of the pack, and he was a leader. Still didn't have a big title. It was only after that that God promoted him to king when he had the big title. But he was a leader way before then. So titles aren't going to get it. You know, when he went back to tending his father's sheep and his livestock, you know what his title was? Sheep herder. <laughs> he went from sheep herder to king. But even as a sheep herder, he had influence. Listen to this. On my job, I really don't care what my title is. Working as a, uh, I think now they call me a senior portfolio manager. I asked my boss, I said, what exactly does that mean? She just laughed. Because I really don't care what my title is. I, I, my, 
my job, I consider my job to do the best I can to serve the people I work for, the people I work with, and the folks who work for me, just to just serve them. It's funny, but it's really true. I've been there less than a year, but it seems like now I have a considerable amount of influence with these folks because I have purpose in my heart to be the best servant there. Not to be the best senior portfolio manager, <laughs> but just to be the best servant. And I got to tell you, Pastor Coyne and Pastor Misty have a great anointing upon their life to develop servant leaders because they are two of the best that I've ever had the privilege to know. They've been serving Bishop and Lady Joy Hash faithfully. They served them faithfully while Pastor was an associate minister there at St. Peter's. And they are still serving them today, 33 years and counting. And folks, you need to understand how important this is. I believe that one of the major reasons that we are such a blessed church, that we're experiencing explosive growth, is because of our faithful service that Pastor has rendered to both Bishop, Lady Joy, and the Hagans over the years. They are following Jesus' example of serving, and we need to follow them as they are following the Lord. Look at the scripture. Hebrews 6.10 in the Amplified says this, For God is not unrighteous to forget or overlook your labor and the love which you have shown for his name's sake in ministering to the needs of the saints, his own consecrated people as you still do. God will not forget, and you will reap what you have sown. So some of you might be asking right now, oh, well, I hear what you're saying. Well, what exactly should I do? I'm very happy you asked that question. Just start serving somewhere. So you can speak to the folks at the information desk. You can go to our website, click the join a team link, find a leader and ask them if they need some help. Find me after service and I'll help you find somewhere to start. I like this scripture, Matthew 23, 11 through 12 in the message says this, do you want to stand out? Then step down. Be a servant. If you puff yourself up, you'll get the wind knocked out of you. Do I have any uh, boxers or martial artists here in the house? I know we've got a few. They don't want to raise their hand because they, oh, okay, Miss Brenda. I remember once I was fighting in a tournament at the black belt, and the guy hit Give me the spinning kick, and I blocked it like this with my elbow, and he drove my elbow right in my solar plexus, knocked the wind clearing out of me. That is not a pleasant feeling <laughs> at all. I mean, you can't breathe. You can't talk. You can't tell anybody what's wrong. It was... So when the Bible says, if you puff yourself up, you'll get the wind knocked out of you, that ain't good. However, if you're content to simply be yourself, your life will count for plenty. Jesus obviously thought that serving was incredibly important. He served all of mankind by giving his life for us. And we looked at the scripture a little earlier, but let's look at it at a different translation. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8, in the easy-to-read version, gives us a clear picture of the importance Jesus put on serving others. He said, in your life together, Paul wrote this, in your life together, think the way Christ Jesus thought. He was like God in every way, but he, Jesus, did not think that his being equal with God was something to use for his own benefit. Instead, he gave up everything, even his place with God. He accepted the role of a servant, appearing in human form, and during his life as a man, he humbled himself by, full, by being fully obedient to God, even when that caused his death, death on a cross." And I have to tell you, being a, having a place to serve has really changed my life personally. And, uh, and some of you, several of you have heard this story. And, and you know what? I would love to talk about y'all. But Pastor said it's more polite to talk about myself. So forgive me if I repeat this story. But years and years and years ago, I was not a church person. Um, I really, I had some bad experiences growing up as a child, religion, church. I, the only reason I started going to church is when I married my wife, Patrice, and God bless her. She'll be here at the 11 a.m. service. She convinced me that we needed more of God in our lives because we were, quite frankly, um, experiencing some very severe challenges. So I believed her. And um, when we first came to North Carolina, and she, the first time she saw a pastor and Pastor Misty 
was at a, another church that we belonged to. I was in Atlanta at the time, and she called me right away. She said, I saw this couple. I saw this couple. Leon, they are amazing. They are awesome. This, these folks need to be our pastors. And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, this, seriously. But when I first came to Horace, here's what amazed me. I just, you know, I was a guy coming come in there as late as possible, sit way in the back, so I'd be close to the door. So as soon as he said, amen, I'm gone. <laughs> but, what, but, I, but I was watching, and I was amazed to see men serving in various positions in the church. And what really amazed me is they looked like they were enjoying themselves. I was like, man, this is weird. <laughs> they looked like they were happy about it. And I kept hearing pastors say these words, serve your way to your destiny, serve your way to your destiny. And I'm like, what does that even mean? You know, serve your way to the destiny. Oh, by the way, it's time for me to go. I got to go. The ball game's on. So, uh, Pastor, last time I, you know, when he first said that, you know, I got so fired up about it, and I immediately started serving. I volunteered for everything, and y'all know that is not true. What really happened is one day when I was leaving, when I was trying to get out the door, somebody grabbed me from behind and said, oh, Brother Leon, before you go, I got a question to ask you. I said, oh, sure. Pastor told me, you know, when somebody starts off the conversation with pastor told you, I mean, what are you going to say? You got to stop and listen, right? Pastor told me to ask you, would you consider being an usher? I'm like, dude, why are you asking me? I mean, you got all these other guys. He said, no, he told me to ask you. He said, don't, don't ask me now because I know you're trying to get out of here. <laughs> he said, what I want you to do is I want you to go home and think about it. Now, when somebody says that to you, what are you going to say? I said, what are you going to say? No, I'm not going to go home and I'm not going to pray. No, I, I couldn't say that. I was in church. <laughs> so I said, okay. And uh, I went home. I did it. I kept my word. I prayed about it. And the more I thought about it, even though my mind was, re was repelling the thought, something in here said, you know, you really should do this. So when I came back next Sunday, the guy was waiting for me. He was waiting for me. Hey, man, did you pray about it? Yes, I did. What did God tell you? He told me to do it. Oh, awesome, awesome. Well, here's what you do. Back then we had radios, man. They were like, like this. I'm serious. You, if you weren't lifting weights, you couldn't carry a radio. You couldn't be on the usher team. I, they were huge. You know, it was, it was phenomenal. But you know what? As time went on, I started enjoying myself being a servant in the house of God. And I found myself literally serving my way to my destiny. Because what happened next was the same guy came to me a couple years later and said, Leon, pastor said, <laughs> I said, stop. I said, dude, don't lie to me. Did pastor really say this? And he said, yes, he did. I said, okay, what did he say? He said, and he said uh, for me to ask you if you would consider leading the usher team. And, I, and I'm like, well, why? Why does he want me to do it? He's like, you'll have to ask him, but I'm doing what he told me to do. And he said, I said, don't tell me. He wants me to go home and pray about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I went home and prayed about it. And God said, yep, I think this is something you should do. So, of course, I came back next week and I told him. And, and it's really funny the more I started serving, the more comfortable I got, and the more I started enjoying it, the more I started realizing benefits, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes, about benefits to being a servant in the house of God. And I found myself literally doing, as Pastor had said, serving my way to my destiny. I, I'm standing before you today as a person. If you had told me 24 years ago that, Leon, one day you're going to be standing up in the pulpit ministering a message to people, and you're going to be the executive director of one of the best multicultural, multiracial, multi-generational churches in America, I would have said, are you crazy? There's no way. But that's where I am today. And it's not saying, I'm not bragging on me, I'm bragging on God. I have literally served my way to my destiny. Are there other things for me to do? God will tell me. You know why? Because he can find me because I'm serving him. Amen. Amen. 
Another thing I learned about serving in the house of God is this. What you make happen for God, he will make happen for you. Galatians 6, 7 says, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A person will reap what they sow. And Ephesians 6 to 8 says, remember that the Lord will reward each of us for the good that we do, whether we are slaves or free. Now, earlier we read in the Amplified Version of this next scripture, Hebrews 6.10. But let's look at this again, this time from the Passion Translation. For God, the faithful one, is not unfair. How can he forget the beautiful work that you have done for him? He remembers the love you demonstrate as you continually serve his beloved ones for the glory of his name. God remembers what you do as you continually serve his beloved ones for the glory of his name. And guess what? He doesn't need an iPad or a laptop or a MacBook to remember. He will remember and he will reward you. And, you know, there's things that happen in our lives. My wife and I, we have five grown kids and untold number of grandchildren. And uh, I think four, we recently had a granddaughter just graduated from uh, Texas Christian University. And we have great grandchildren. I know I'm, I'm way too young to have great grandchildren, but it is what it is. And we're very happy about that. But, you know, when you have grown kids, there are things that you cannot control. You, you still think that you're their parent, but uh, you are their parent naturally. But, but you know what? God can direct them. He can send perfect labors to their path. I, can't, I, I wish I had enough time to tell you just some of the things that God has done for us that I believe that we didn't even know was happening because we were serving him in the house of God. I can tell you this one story. I used to travel back and forth to Washington, D.C. I know several, several of the guys here that I've served with know this. And I would come home on the weekends, uh, spend Saturday at home, come to church on Sunday. As soon as I get home, change clothes, hop in the car, but lay back up in Washington, D.C., serving as a contractor. And, uh, and uh, that assignment had finished, and I had interviewed for a new assignment, a raise, everything, a promotion with a totally different company, up, but it was still up in D.C. It was a great opportunity, but when I came back from accepting that, and uh, the house I was staying in at the time, something went inside of me says, hey, why don't you call so-and-so who was a technical recruiter that I have dealt with in the past. And long story short, within 72 hours of me making that phone call, I had another job offer in North Carolina, a better position and higher pay than the job that I had just accepted in Washington, D.C. I had no control over that. And it was really great because I needed to be here so I could be closer to Pastor and Pastor Misty so I could serve more and help them more realize everything that God has called them to do. I'm telling you, serving God has benefits as well. Here's a few sentences from the book In Search of Timothy by Reverend Tony Cook, who's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man of God. He's a close friend of pastors, and he's a close friend of this church. He wrote this. You were created by God to make a significant impact in your local church. Pastors all over the world are looking for staff and volunteers who are willing to assist in the growth and advancement of the kingdom of God. When you volunteer to serve in your church or join a church staff, you have embraced an essentially heavenly assignment. Wow. Serving in the local church is an essential heavenly assignment. God has a lot to say about serving in his word, and I just want to go over a few scriptures. 1 Peter 4.10 in the easy-to-read version says, God has shown you his grace in many different ways. So be good servants and use whatever gift he has given you in a way that will best serve each other. God has given each and every one of us gifts that we can use to serve people here in the church. You may think that you don't have a gift, but I beg to differ. God has placed something in each and every one of us. There is something that you can do that we all need. And you know what? There's something in us that you need as well. Just start serving. Let God grow you. That gift that you think that you don't have before you know it will flourish and become something much greater and more valuable than you can even possibly imagine right now. Psalms 100 verse 2 says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Oh, man, this is so important. How many of you have ever ask somebody to do something for you and go like, oh, okay. All right, I'll, I'll do it. Dude, don't, never mind. <laughs> Please, don't put yourself out. 
Oh, attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. As we start serving God, we need to do it with gladness in our heart, with a great attitude, particularly when we don't feel like it. I, I can't tell you how many times I come to church and I didn't want to get out of bed that day. I did not. It, <laughs> He said, amen, brother, preach it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, but you know what? I got up, got dressed, prayed. I was here. I felt so much better when I left here than when I did when I came in the door. When we don't feel like it, that's when our attitude really counts, having a great attitude. It really pleases God when we are serving him, even at those <laughs> moments that we really don't want to. It pleases him. Mark 10 to 45 in the New King James Version says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as ransom for many. Folks, I have found out that it's not about me. It's about the people around the world who, if we do not do our part, they are going to bust hell wide open. It's not about me. I'm already saved. If you're saved, it's not about you. I don't know about you, but I don't want that on my conscience. I want to find myself doing the very best that I can do with the talents, gifts, and abilities that God has given me so that I can help however many people I can help get to heaven. I purpose to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And I really, really, truly admire our pastors because they will serve anywhere and they will do whatever needs to be done for people and for the church. Why? Because they realize that everything they do to serve others here at the church helps those folks. And he by helping those folks, it helps the church get stronger. Folks, it's truly not about us. It's about those we can and should serve. Luke 6.38 says this. Give to others and you will receive. You will be given much. It will be poured into your hands. More than you can hold. You will be given so much that it will spill into your lap. The way you give to others is the way God will give to you. There is a reward for serving others. And this scripture is usually quoted in the context of money, but it applies to everything we give. If you get kindness, guess what you're going to get? Kindness. If you give grace and mercy, guess what you're going to get? If you're a friend to people, guess what? If you're friendly towards people, you're going to have people be friendly towards you. The opposite is true, too. Our time, our resources, our love, our kindness, our forgiveness, our mercy, folks, it is impossible to outgive God. Impossible. Notice that the scripture says the way we give to others is the way God will give to us. In John 13, verse 12 to 15 in the Passion Translation says, I read this and I, I was in tears. Jesus said, after washing their feet, he, Jesus, put his robe on and returned to his place at the table. And he said to the disciples, do you understand what I just did? You've called me your teacher and your Lord, and you're right, for that's who I am. So if I'm your teacher and Lord and have just washed your dirty feet, then you should follow the example that I've set for you and wash another's dirty feet. Now, do for each other what I have just done for you. Jesus was and remains the ultimate servant leader. He gave his life for us, but before doing so, he modeled what serving others is all about. So I'm going to wrap up with these five points on why I think serving is more important than we realize. Number one, I'm going to repeat the words that pastor spoke last Sunday. He said that if we are serving the church, God knows exactly where we are when he's ready to give us the next step. It, when he's given us the next step of the direction that he wants us to take. However, if we're not serving in the church, it is likely that God will not give us more direction because we probably would not do it anyway since we're not doing anything right now. I know some of y'all are going, ouch, hallelujah. <laughs> Number two, just start serving somewhere. Again, speak to the folks at the information desk. Go to our website and click join a team, find a leader, ask them if they need some help, find me after service, I'll help you. Find somewhere to start. Don't let me be the guy to grab you by the shoulders you're trying to leave. <laughs> Saying, pastor asked me to, 
No. This ministry is growing, and we need everybody's help. And God needs your help. Number three, remember what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us. And God is not asking us to do that. But I believe he is asking us to use the talents and the gifts that he gave us to serve in our church. Number four, serving has benefits. God sees and remembers every bit of service that we render in the church, and he will give us much more than we give others. And number five, I recommend that we not be so much concerned with our ultimate place in the ministry. Just start serving somewhere. And one day, you're going to wake up like I woke up a year or so ago, and I said, man. Actually, it was after a conversation I had with a pastor. He's like, Leon, he's, and I'm paraphrasing now, he says, you know, you're where God wants you to be. He says, you're in the middle of God's will. I was like, I am? Well, glory. I said, yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> Glory to God. And that, I am not unusual. God is not a respecter of persons. What he's done for one, he'll do for others. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for this awesome word I, that you wanted me to deliver to these folks today, Father. I pray that everyone takes it to heart, everyone in the sound of my voice. And Father, thank you that in this house, that you are helping our pastors to raise up a solid army of servant leaders and that we're going out and we're making a difference in the body of Christ. We're making a difference in this world. We are helping people. But it all starts with us, Father. And so we just honor you, sir. We praise you and we bless you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So everything I just talked about is great. And, but let's make sure, let's take care of the most important thing before you leave the service. You know... The world today is, there's, there's a lot of trouble in the world, as we all know. And every time I hear a, a tragedy happen of this number of people lost their lives or this person died in an automobile accident, my first thought is, where did they go? Because, folks, we will all spend eternity somewhere in one of two places. It's either heaven or it's hell. When I think about those people, I find myself hoping that someone gave them the opportunity to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior before they took their last breath here on this earth. Because if they did and they accepted that, then their last breath here on earth was indeed their first breath in heaven. We know that with absolute certainty. So guess what? You can have that assurance too. And God wants to give you the opportunity to have him become your father by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the Bible says there's only one way to the Father, and his name is Jesus. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to pray in a minute. And I just want to ask a simple question. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come up here. But I'm going to ask you if you would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and have the assurance that if something were to happen to you today, tomorrow, that you would go to heaven. I just want you to signify that just by raising your hand quickly just so I can acknowledge it. Thank you. So I'm going to ask every person here to pray these words and pray these words after me. Father, thank you for making a way for me to be saved, forgiven and free. I believe in my heart that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross, to wipe away all of my sins. I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. And Jesus, I ask you now to be my Lord and my Savior, and I confess that you are my Lord. Jesus, you are now my Lord. Amen. Thank you.